like I said, um, it's warm. We're having a heat wave here. It's very difficult to describe. It's, imagine the temperature is the same, but the humidity is 80%. So it's sweaty. And um, it was a five hour boat ride to the island of Laganov. And um, it was, the traveling was exhausting. You know, it takes three hours to go 30 miles in Haiti in five years ago. So everyone's very tired. And um, we had, uh, we were on the boat and it's warm and the boat's rocking. And most of my team fell asleep on the boat around me. Um, and I was actually grateful for that. We were exhausted. Um, I didn't fall asleep. I had um, our, we had two interpreters, Kaz, who was the interpreter for all of the Dixon teams. <coughs> He may as well be a member of our congregation. I feel like he's here with us. Um, great guy. He was also our interpreter. We had another interpreter that I had never worked with before. His name is Richard. Um, Richard doesn't like boats. He uh, got very seasick and was kind of scared. And I could sense this. He was sort of sitting near me. And as everyone else is falling asleep, Richard is, starts to talk to me. And he told me a story. Um, it was one of the most important conversations I've ever had in my life, and at the time I didn't realize it. So I wrote this, uh, what I'm going to tell you today, the other night, and I wanted to sort of give you some background so it made sense. Um, and I'll go off, talk, I'll go off what I wrote a, a couple of times to explain what I mean. But um, today's message is about mission work and about about working for the ultimate victory of God when you don't know what that looks like, and you might not ever know what that looks like. So, when I was in Haiti this trip, I was asked to give a sermon in the church on the island of Wagadam. On the boat ride over, I had been inspired by our interpreter, Richard. Most of my team had fallen asleep on a very long boat ride across the ocean. I, however, had one of the most important conversations of my life. Richard is a translator, but more importantly, he is a missionary. Something rare in Haiti is a Haitian that considers himself a missionary. Missionaries are blanc. That's what they call us white folks. And we normally come from the United States, and we come with a purpose, we build something, we bring something, and we leave. That's what the Haitians see as missionaries. But Richard is Haitian, and he's also a missionary. We struck up, uh, struck up an instant friendship, and he told me the long story about his life. His story is the story of a million Haitians. However, who Richard has become is the story of Christ's love in action. Richard's mother was 14 when she had him. She was illiterate and without work. They lived in a small mountain village of Veritas, which is up, there's a, there's a road in Haiti called Highway 3, and it's not paved, and it's steep, and if you need a four-wheel drive vehicle to get there. Veritas is up in that mountain region, and like a lot of places in Haiti, it's far from Port-au-Prince, and services and resources there are scarce. Um, Richard's mother was without any resources, and she was desperate. His father died when he was a baby, and she um, happened to be taken on. There's a Baptist mission in Veritas, and she was taken on as a maid in the mission. Now, this is the first step in Richard's journey to become who he is now. Um, you see, there, there is no public schools in Haiti. If you are unable to pay for school, your child goes without education. If your child goes without education, your child does not learn to speak French. In Haiti, if you do not speak French, you cannot participate in the socioeconomic processes of the country. The newspapers are written in French. Uh, the governmental actions happen in French. However, the language that the people speak is Creole. So if you are unable to pay for your child to go to school, your child doesn't learn to speak French, and they're really lacking an ability for any upward motion in that culture. Um, they're unable to participate, they're unable to understand what's going on because they can't read French. So Richard, um, he grew up there. He had really fond memories of the mission. Um, they paid for him to go to school. It's a missionary school, a mission school. Um, and he was educated in his elementary years there. Um, unfortunately, his, his mother was struck by lightning when he was 17 and died. He was able to finish his elementary education there. Um, however, because she had died, she didn't work there anymore. Um, the mission couldn't put him through secondary school. So secondary school in Haiti is much, much like 
our college, maybe even a trade school as we would see it. And the structure there is, is there's a very few, I mean very few, 2% of the population that has, um, you know, it's a middle class basically. And the rest, which aren't described to me, is they call it the mass. And to get out of the mass, you need to have some sort of trade. You need to go to this trade college. And that, he desired that. He really, um, social status in Haiti is as important as it is here in the United States. It's just the opportunities are so few and far between. Richard constantly was bringing up how he wanted to, um, I, I want to, he wants to be somebody. And I would learn why. It wasn't because he wants to be wealthy. It wasn't because he wants stuff for himself. It's because um, he is a true missionary. Uh, let's see. Richard was one of the lucky children. He was able to attend school. However, when after his mother died, that was it for him. He couldn't figure out what he was going to do. He had an uncle that lived in the United States, and he called him. Um, in Haitian culture, if you have the means to help your family, it's expected that you do so. However, Richard's uncle said no. He said, I'm sorry, you'll have to just get a job and go work like everyone else, and, and no. So his friends, his peers went off to secondary school. Um, their families had money, and they were able to do that. He went to drive a tap tap in Port au Prince. Now this is in the mid to late 1990s, um, a, very, a very rough period of instability in Haiti. There was a military presence there. They were at the end of, um, of an unstable government, and things in the city were tense. Um, the military had occupied the city trying to maintain order among the frustrated masses, and Richard, Richard recalled feeling helpless, unable to change his situation. His friends um, were, had gone. He worked as a tap shop driver for four or five years, and during that time he would run into people that he knew, and they, they were having that upward mobility that he so desired. Um, he was depressed. He was frustrated. Richard uh, was angry and helpless, and a missionary from Canada who had befriended him in Veritas kept contact with him. She called him and offered to pay for him to attend Wyoman University, which is a missionary school. He had no idea what that meant to be a missionary, but here was a missionary offering to pay for him to have that secondary education, and frankly, he didn't care. He said, yes! And he would tell his family, his extended family, I'm going to Wyoming University to become a missionary. And they all looked at him as if he'd lost his mind. What's a mission, what is a missionary school? And he couldn't explain it, because at the time he had no idea. But for him it was a way out, the way out of his current situation. He had big dreams of becoming a doctor. However, at this time someone was offering him an education. He took it, explained it to people he was going to school to become a missionary. At this point in the story, he tells me about those confused faces of his family members um, that couldn't understand what exactly he'd be doing. He had no idea, but he was excited to have the opportunity, and he jumped at the chance. His training allowed him to obtain a visa and travel to the United States. He stayed with the Amish in Pennsylvania and visited many sh churches around the United States and got a feel for the American culture. He was able to speak in those churches, um, and his English improved. He began to see himself as an instrument of God's will at this time. Everything in his life had led up to him becoming a missionary and starting a foundation in his own hometown. In Haiti, a visa is a ticket out of misery, out of the slums and the constant suffering that those Haitians experience. They are nearly impossible to get. You have to... You have to own property, you have to have something to vouch for you, you have to leave property with the Haitian government. Ha Haitian visas to be able to travel abroad are almost impossible to get. He has one. When people get those visas, it is extremely rare that they return to Haiti. Why would you? If you can get a way up and a way out, and a way to send your family money, and a job in the United States, why would you come back? Um, Richard, however, always returns home. He comes to the United States twice a year, and he always returns home. He happens to be judged harshly for this behavior in Veritas. His community members cannot understand why he comes back. Um, they say things to him like, if he was a real man, he would go and make something of himself in America. But he's not a real man because he keeps coming home. So he has this internal struggle where he knows he's doing what he's called to do. 
He is an instrument of God's will, but the people don't yet believe in him. So he needs this upward mobility in his own country to create believers in his mission. <coughs> so this is the story he's telling me on the boat. Um, slowly but surely, his foundation that he started in that mountain village has grown. Um, he has 19 kids that are supported by Americans um, that are going to school. 36 kids actually live in the foundation, and they're all being educated in some way or another, but 19 of them have full sponsorship. And this is really important to him, and um, it's going well. Richard explained to me on the boat that Haitian people are skeptical of American missionaries at first because they can't understand why we would save our own money and come to work for free in a place like Haiti. Again, this happens to be an example of Christ's love, love in action, and action makes believers. And this is what Richard wants to show his own community. People in Haiti have faith. In fact, there are no Sunday Christians in Haiti. You know, the kind of Christians we go to church on Sunday, we believe on Sunday, and we go back to our regular life on Monday and don't think about it again until next week. Um, in Haiti, where the people have very little control over their situations and their status, they have control over their faith. They believe. They believe all the time. Faith is something they have control over, and they live each day in relationship with Christ. This obviously doesn't mean that the Haitians have any faith in their government or the systems in place in Haiti, such as the NGOs, the non-governmental organizations such as the Red Cross, Samaritan's Purse, the large organizations where the money and the services get trapped in the giant umbrella of bureaucracy, but it doesn't actually trickle down to the masses. Um, however, Haitians trust missionaries because we're the ones that go in and get dirty. We suffer with them side by side, and we don't ask for anything in return. On that boat ride, I explained to Richard that I have had the call for missionary work for three years, and has sometimes been like a disease or an affliction that has overcome me. The drive so strong to get back to the beauty and misery in Haiti that I can't sometimes focus on my actual life. I told Richard that my brother is an atheist, and he can't understand why we want to go and work in what he calls hell on earth. With a smile, and Richard's got a great smile. He's a really charismatic guy. He looks at me and he says, your brother needs to meet me. I would be nothing. I would be nowhere without missionaries. Everything good in my life has come from missionaries. And that is now why it's my life's work to give back. It was at this point in the conversation that I experienced only what I can describe as a testimony clarity and conviction, understanding about my place and my purpose. I saw my mission service as if it were a stone thrown into the ocean, the ripples representing the positive effects my work would have on the Haitian people. Unfortunately, at that time, on that boat, in my mind's eye, the ripples only went so far before I couldn't see them anymore. All my work, stemming from the first trip I had gone on three years ago, had shaped the current situation and helped form the team that I was currently leading. One action directly affected another, letting the pieces fall into place and create the team that was sleeping on the boat around me. Three years ago, I had dug what I thought were pretty insignificant ditches in Mel Yay. It rained every night and they filled up with water, and I felt like we got nowhere. After that, my husband and son were inspired to go again on another trip to Lebec with some of our members here that are today. And they demolished an entire church, saw a project from start to finish, and they felt satisfied. Um, that experience inspired Dr. Wiley to say in her office one day that she would love to go to Haiti and do dental work. It was never my intention to go take a dental team, but that was what God had delivered me, and I took the challenge. Sitting there on that boat, I could only see the ripples of my mission work looking backwards. You know the old saying that hindsight is 2020. At that moment on that boat, I was having the most powerful hindsight I've ever had in my life. Unbeknownst to me at that time, the work that we would go do on Laganav was crucial, was critical, it was life-saving, it was brutal, it was horrific, it was painful, it was beautiful. After I arrived on the island of Laganav, even though we had been prepared by Sarah, for what we were going to see. I think you can prepare 
but you can't be prepared for what it's going to feel like. And it was a late in Saturday afternoon, we were exhausted, we were sunburned, and I, over the course of the day, leading up to Sunday's service the next day, I was asked if I would speak in church, and I felt motivated to do so. I walked through the community and I saw people that I love, that I care about, and they're starving, they're suffering, they're desperate, and I felt like it was part of my call to give them hope in some way. So that night, I sat down, scared, and feeling underqualified to write a sermon. I sat down and wrote this sermon, and it was inspired by Richard's story. It was inspired by that conversation, and um, I have to be honest, I'm going to read you what I wrote, but it's a remembrance of what I actually wrote. Because on the last day, Richard enjoyed the sermon so much, he asked me if he could have it. And without thinking, I just whipped it out of my binder, and I said, here you go. I should have copied it down, because it was really good. <laughs> you know, it was one of those things where I was like, gosh, I can't believe I read that. Um, but this is what I remember. And I really did, when I wrote it, it was translated by my dear friend, Kaz, um, who I made promise to translate directly, because there's kind of a joke in Haiti. Americans talk fast, we use slang that doesn't translate. So a lot of times, a Haitian translator has to kind of wing it. And there's a movie in Haiti about American missionaries that come, and it's kind of about the translators. And Kaz is telling me this story before we go to church, and he said, you know, the American missionary is talking and talking, and he's going really fast, translator can't keep up, and he looks at the people and he goes, the American missionaries have bought peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, get down on your knees and pray! And they all drop to their knees and pray, and he's saying ridiculous things, and they have no idea, but they're happy. So anyway, I made him promise um, to translate word for word. This is what I wrote. Missionary work is like a stone thrown into the ocean. You may never get to see the effects of your efforts. I came to your country two years ago, and I see change. I see improvements and progress on the mainland. Haiti is healing from an earthquake, and I am proud of that progress. Today, however, I see a community that is still struggling. I see hungry faces in Sousa Philippe, thirsty children hoping for help. Change can be hard when you see frustrating, hard to see and frustrating to wait for when your family is suffering. The progress seems slow when your needs are so great, but have faith, my friends. Haiti is strong, full of faithful servants following the word of the Lord. I love Haiti. My team and I have worked all year long to be able to bring help to those who need it. Having faith and doing good works can be hard when change and mercy seem slow to come. Pain and suffering seem so rampant. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 7, the Bible says, Ask, and God will give to you. Search, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be open for you. Yes, everyone who asks will receive. Everyone who searches will find, and everyone who knows will have the door opened. But sometimes, the gifts that we are given are not the ones that we think we need. When you're hungry and thirsty, that's what you're searching for. Have faith, my friends, and continue to live in gratitude. The Bible also says in James chapter 2, verse 5, Listen, my dear brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he, who he has promised to those who love him? I see faith and love in your eyes. And even though that change is slow, keep working. Keep your eyes on the Lord and know that you matter. You are important. You are loved. You are the future of Haiti, and you will be an example by your diligence, your faith, and your love for one another. Just like that stone that's thrown into the ocean, we may never see our good deeds come to fruition. We may never know the effect we've had or the part we've played in God's ultimate victory. Only 12 disciples were specially called to follow Jesus and his ministry, but what about the others who followed him, who were not specially called? Others like you and me. Many ordinary people followed the teachings of Jesus and had faith in his words. We are those ordinary followers doing great things. Paul was also an ordinary follower. 
follower, and he went out into the world to spread the good news of Jesus Christ. He was an ordinary man, and in his lifetime, he probably never got to see the effects of his missionary service. He had faith, he followed the call, and he did his work. You do not need to see an entire staircase in the dark to know that the next step is there. What you do is you put one foot in front of the other and have faith that ultimately you will reach the top of the staircase. My friends, you are part of that story, the staircase that ultimately leads to God's victory in Haiti. Have faith, keep stepping up and move forward. That's what I said in church to those people. That was the testimony I was called to write. I looked into the crowd of brown faces and there weren't that many people there, but they were smiling and nodding their heads and I saw positivity. I saw God in their faces, love in their hearts, and these people had no with nothing, who were hungry and desperate, did feel hope. And that's what I wanted to give them. I have been given a gift, an affliction, a disease, so I call, the desperate need to work amongst the poor in Haiti. Um, I don't understand the complete story of my missionary work, and at this point, we might not ever know the effects of what we have done, the young Richards that we inspire to take back their country, to fight for justice for the masses, fight for basic health care and basic sanitation. You see, we fight for God's ultimate victory, but we are not privy to know what that victory looks like. Blind and following faith is what missionaries are called to do. We're a right now society. We want to see results now. Wikipedia, Google, Yahoo, all of these things fuel that instantaneous need for knowledge and answers and success now. Being a missionary challenges our modern day notions of a job well done. We don't get to see that gratification while we're there. That was difficult. There was a lot of unanswered questions and we had to just keep our heads down and keep working and doing what we knew we were called to do. When we got back to the mainland, we had a wonderful debriefing with Tom Benefis, who has been in Haiti since the earthquake. He's worked in Haiti a long time. And we talked about the things that we had seen, the things that we had done, things that I don't think any of us expected to do. We weren't prepared to do, but we did them because that's why we were there. He told us a story um, about an Anglican priest who worked as a World War II medic. This guy saw human suffering at a level that he could not comprehend. Bodies blown up, people killed, he couldn't understand it. This caused him to struggle with his faith as a whole, and as an Anglican priest, that could be a problem. He would write down the experiences that troubled him, and he would place them in a drawer that he labeled, awaiting further knowledge. It's a bit how I feel about our trip. We did things and saw things in Sousa Philippe that I cannot comprehend and I cannot understand yet. I don't know if I'll ever understand them. We saw the inequities of the human experience on a visceral level that made me question everything I know. Life and death, infection and injury, preventable, simple, painful, brutal. I look at the pictures of the children that we saw on the island, pictures that Lisa took, and they are beautiful children. I have to put those pictures in the awaiting further knowledge drawer. I don't understand the world where those sweet souls are neglected by politics, economics, and a history of a republic that preys on its own people. The only thing I can understand is that they are beautiful, important pieces of a puzzle that will unfold in, ha un that will unfold in Haiti. There is a Haitian proverb that I heard while I was there that says, God provides everything we need, but he is not the one to divvy it up. That's a really hard thing to sit with when you're there amongst the poor. Mission work is not for everyone. I didn't know that it was going to be my affliction. Some people go to Haiti and they never want to go back. Some people go to Haiti, some of those people are here today, and they will always go back. I thank you, who are all sitting here, for helping me, and those who went with me into walk into the painful, messy world that is Haiti. Um, I will continue to throw my stones into the ocean, and I won't focus on where the ripples will end up, because that's not my job. I will leave the ripples to God, and I will know that we each have different gifts, and we are each there for a different purpose. But I have faith that the ripples will continue to go, because that's God's mission. 
We all have different gifts, each of which come because of the grace God gave us. And the Bible tells us, and I believe this in my whole heart, and each one of you that are here today have your own mission work that you will embark on in your life. It doesn't have to be to be an international medical missionary. That is not everyone's call. But everyone does have a call. Um, that's what it is to be human. The Bible tells us that anyone, sorry, the person who has the gift of prophecy should use that gift in agreement with the faith. Anyone who has the gift of serving should serve. Anyone who has the gift of teaching should teach. Whoever has the gift of encouraging others should encourage. Whoever has the gift of giving to others should give freely. Anyone who has the gift of being a leader should try hard when he or she leads. Your love must be real. Hate what is evil and hold on to what is good. Love each other like brothers and sisters. No matter what we accomplish there, I know that we're part of God's ultimate victory in Haiti. And I believe that it is going to continue, whether we're there or not. And those children, those beautiful souls that are so deserving of the things that we have for our own kids, they're part of God's ultimate victory. They know that people love them. They know that missionaries came to bring them what they needed. Whether or not it stays, they get better, they get worse, they know that they're loved. And they will go out and love others the way that we love them. That's part of the mission. So I, I didn't want to talk today about the details they're messy, they're painful, I'm not really ready to say what they are. Um, I encourage you, James writes, um, it's the Benny blog, you know, um, Audrey's always posting it on Facebook. So if you're friends with church on Facebook, it's, it's uh, they call me Betty.com, and that's James for a lot of reasons, I want to explain why he's called Betty, but he is. Um, and you can read about the details. But what I encourage you to do <laughs> is look inside and find your mission. It doesn't have to be this mission, but we are all God's servants. We are those ordinary disciples called out into the world to spread the good news. And the good news is that we're all human and that we love each other. And that's what it's about. So thank you for your support. I know that our team felt the prayers and the warmth and the compassion that came from our church family and Dixon, the Dixon community as a whole.